I mean, as we're going, and, and we'll see how far we can get um, throughout the journey. So we spoke about, in the last presentation, we spoke about that, how the Declaration of Independence is defining the hierarchy of God, then people, then the state. And specifically, the Declaration of Independence is, is dealing with the relationship between God and the people. And so from that perspective, it is entirely accurate and okay for the Declaration of Independence to talk about God in all the different ways that it does, um, or the Creator. Um, because that's the justification, and speaking of this relationship. Um, it's talking about the unalienable rights that you have, and the fact that um, God has given these rights to the, to the people, and the state can't trample upon those rights, because it's above the state, the state's um, jurisdiction. Now, when we come to the Constitution, the Constitution doesn't mention God at all, and the reason it can't mention God is because it's only dealing with the relationship between the people and the state. And as you can see here, God is not part of that at all. It's just about that relationship and how the state is going to protect the unalienable rights um, or how, you know, how to protect civility, I guess you, you could say it that way. And we also spoke about, we started talking about the... Um, this dynamic here, the dynamic of Europe being the fifth kingdom, a symbol of the fifth kingdom of Bible prophecy, and the United States being a symbol of the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. And that this transition wasn't accomplished fully when they went over there, obviously, because one, the 1260 years haven't, hadn't ended yet, obviously, but also the fact that though they were separated ge geographically, Europe still had a chain of bondage wrapped around the Americans here in, uh, in the colonies. And it wasn't until, and we, had, we identified that this chain, this bondage of the 1260 that was here from Great Britain, um, is the problem that needs to be dealt with. And that problem isn't formally dealt with until 1776 where the chain is broken and this process, of, uh, this process can begin. And the Declaration of Independence, we said, is is like the arrival of the message. This, this message comes and it's going to, um, it's going to begin a work. Now, I'm going to um, erase some of these things. So we know the plowing is the preparation of the soil. We talked about that. And we, we know that the agricultural model is showing us our reform line. You know, and we're gonna we're gonna draw it here momentarily, but what we know about the first angel's message when it arrives, because that's what the Declaration of Independence is symbolizing at the time of the end, that's what this beginning point would be, uh, when the plowing begins. Um, the plow has to do its work. You know, if we stay within the agricultural model, the plow may have arrived here, but the plow now has to go through and make its furrows and its process. And as we say this preparation of the soil. And what did we say that the plow is doing? It breaks up the ground and what happens to what happens to the weeds or the thick uh, the thistles that were there before? They get put underneath, they get buried. Um, they die so to speak. They get dealt with. They get overturned. So all the different things that made the darkness, made the ground fallow get overturned here at this point here. So and it's a process, as we said. Now, if we jump to our model, and we mark this as the time of the end, beginning the arrival of the message, what comes next? An increase of knowledge. There's got to be an increase of knowledge. And what does that increase of knowledge lead to? A formalization. So what is the difference between the arrival of the message and the formalization of the message? What is the difference between the arrival of the message and the formalization of the message? No, not found it. What? Okay, you understand it full um, in a more complete way. Any, anything else? Yeah. 
So you have just an idea or a principle and then it becomes, thing, becomes something more usable or as my brother said, you actually understand it. So let's take Miller for instance. When the message arrived in, um, if we would make this the time of the end. So, okay, I need to, I need to pause. So let's, let's, deal with, let's deal with that and then I need to sidetrack ourselves for a second. Um, so, in seven, uh, so at the time of the end, when the message arrives from Miller, you know, take away our dates here. Um, let's say this is 1798, so the time of the end. So Miller is going to receive this message. Does he have a complete understanding of the message? No. What message does he actually receive? Not a big message yet. I mean, he gets his concordance. You know, he starts to do some, he starts being introduced to the thoughts, but he's not really going to make all that, do all that work of really understanding and studying until years later. Um, so it's a process. He's got to go through an experience from, the 1798 till when he's full, when the message is fully formalized. And what happens when the message is formalized? What can Miller do now? He can give it, he can preach it now because he fully understands it. So it's a message that gets, the difference between the arrival and the formalization is that the message gets put in a nice little package that you can hand out to people. Say, this is what we believe. Um, and they can be tested by it or they can be, you know, they can work with it. So. That's the same dynamic here, is the Declaration of Independence is the message's arrival. The, the concept comes onto the scene of action, comes onto the stage, but it's not formalized into anything yet. The Declaration of Independence isn't binding. It's just a statement. All it says is, this is what we believe, and because of what our beliefs are, we're separating from you. So when are those principles formalized into a nice package? With the Constitution. And as we said before, the Constitution is 1789. So I need to just sidetrack ourselves for just a moment. <coughs> so let me erase always this. I'll erase all this. <clears throat> so you have um, I don't know if anyone has seen this yet, but I'm gonna I'm gonna raise a, a conundrum for you. Um, and, and I just remembered this conundrum. So, at the time of the end, for Millerite, for the Millerites, we, it's when? We just said it. 1798. Now, when is the um, first angel's message in power? 1840. So, I'll just put a 1E, one, one e, first angel's message in power. So, it arrives, 1A. And it's a power here. Okay with that? So I'm going to take this same history. We're talking about a similar history, but I'm going to change. If you've noticed already, I've already changed it. When am I marking the time of the end? In 1776. And when am I saying the first empowerment is? 1798. 1798. Um, yeah, 1798 here. This is when the, this is the formalization. So you have time at the end, formalization, first encounter. Um, and that's when the seed is sown. What happened here? This is the, this is when the seed is coming up. You're saying historically what happened? Or what? Yep, so this is Declaration of Independence, Constitution, and this is Revelation 13, 11. This is when Sister White says the seed is coming up, um, coming up out of the ground, um, 1798. So the conundrum I want you to see is this. That I'm taking the same year of 1798, and in one instance, we're calling it the time of the end. In another instance, I'm calling it the first encounterment. Is anyone, is everyone okay with that? Why am I allowed to do this? In 1798, historically, you mean? So, there's a, oh, what happens here? This is the Constitution. Yeah, it's in, it's in the paragraph. Well, think about it. This, this is when John has seen the, the United States rising, 1798. 
Now, what happened in 1798? There's a couple things that happened here. Um, I don't want to mention them now. I probably won't mention them today because they're just they're part of slavery. Um, but there's several things that happened here. Yeah, well, that, that's what we did. We found this point. Sister White gives us 1798 with Revelation 1311, where the seed is coming up, <coughs> and we created the stuff, we, the waymarks before it. Um, and there are events that take place there, but we're not going to. No, recognized, yep. That's part of it. Yeah, there's a couple things that happened this year that are significant. Are you okay with that, Mrs. Sister? Okay. So. Why can we do this? Why can we say that 1798 at one level is the time of the end, but at another is representing the morning? Can we do that? Because parables, okay? Yeah, two different aspects. Two different lines. It's that simple. We're looking at what? What do you mean two institutions? So they're two different... The easiest, the best way to say that is they're two different lines. This is one perspective, and this is another perspective, and they don't contradict each other because you don't put them together. Um, you can't look at them at the same time. You know, you can't look at two different time of the ends in the exact same moment. There's only ever just one time of the end, um, depending on your line. So what we see here. It's just two lines, and I don't want anyone to be confused by that. I take this for granted sometimes in my own mind, but I know some people that struggle with that. So it's basically like the United States representing What do you mean by that? Symbolically representing right? Are you saying these specific lines? Yeah, because you have the 1798 one, the Alexandria one, the one that was Oh, you're bringing Alexandria in there. Okay. It's a good question. I don't know what you would say they were representing if it's a beast. I see why you're saying beast from Revelation 13. Um, I see the distinction you're meaning. I just don't know what word to put on it. Okay. Yeah, Agri agricultural for it. I, I see your, what you're saying. Um, So, okay, so that's, that is that. If everyone's okay with that, then that's awesome. Um, then there's no, no problem there. We can move from that. Um, so we, we talked about the Constitution. We said that this is, this is the message arrives and then it gets formalized here. It's put into a nice package at this point. Something that's concrete, something that's binding, something that lays out a government. What does the Declaration of Independence say? Do you remember what it said? It says that it says that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and institute new government. So it's saying that we have a right to make a new government um, based upon these principles, but they haven't made it yet. They're going to make a new government, depending on if you want to look at the, there's a, there's a little, the easiest way to say it, the simplest way, they haven't made it yet until 1789. But there is the, the thought that they have the Articles of Federation of that. And that's what they're working towards the, the final product of the Constitution. But anyway, so they say we can form, we can abolish government and form new government, and then they're going to actually do that here. So it's a progression of the, the, the thoughts, and it's now put into a package. It's formalized. We have the time of the end, the arrival of a message, then it's formalized, and then this message is established. I guess you can say it that way. It's, um, it's established. <laughs> okay. I want to, one second. So I want to, I want to talk about, there's a couple different ways we can go from here. And I, the first thing I want to do is I want to, speak just a little bit longer about the Declaration of Independence. Um, Brother Paul, how long do I have for your camera? I have, an hour, I have a full hour. So 
I'm going to erase this here. And I just want to lay a couple more things down for just a moment, a couple lines quickly, and then we'll move on to, or actually, sorry, let me, let me do this first and do one other thing first. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about these two, two principles. So I want to read a pair. We read this paragraph and I want to read it one more time. So this is this paragraph here. Oh, I raised it. This is, um, Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, June 13, 1899. We read that earlier. This is A.T. Jones. He says this, Thus, the two great principles of the Declaration of Independence and of the Constitution, the fundamental principles of government of the United States, firstly, all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And the second, government derives their just power from the consent of the government. I want to talk about those two things for a moment. So, the first one says what? How would you summarize that? I'll read it again. The first principle, all men are created equal and, and are endowed with certain unalienable rights. So he's saying these two principles, the idea that you are endowed by your creator with certain unalienable rights and you're created equal. Sorry, let me read that. All men are created equal endowed and are endowed with certain unalienable rights, that principle and the principle that governments derive their just power from the consent of the governed, these two principles are the foundation of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. So just for context. So how would you summarize the first one? How would you summarize this thought? All men are created equal and are endowed with, their, with certain unalienable rights. How would you summarize that thought? What is it trying to tell you? That you're free? you're free and equal. So we see the equal part for sure, because it says all men are created equal and endowed with certain inalienable rights. So let's do this. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to summarize the whole thing and just say um, unalienable rights. And we'll talk about that for just in a moment. Because I don't want to have to write the whole sentence down. So we have unalienable rights and we have the consent of the governed. These two principles. These are the foundations of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. So why do you have unalienable rights? Let's talk about unalienable rights. Well, first of all, what did we say they were in our last present, in our last class? What is an unalienable right? It's a God-given right. And what makes it so special other than that it's God-given? Or what are the dynamics of that right? Can I give it away? Can I, can I, can someone take it away? No. So it can neither be taken nor given. And it's something you get from God. And it's because that it comes from God that it can neither be taken nor given. Why, why is that though? because it's not your property. So for me, this is, I don't want to necessarily say synonymous, but it's similar to the idea of justification. When you're justified, what is, what is justification? You're made what? You're made right, okay. Um, who makes you right? God. Why does he make you right? Or by, let me say it this way. Is it by your own power that you're made right? No, God does that. He, he, he gives it to you. So this is the idea of imparted and imputed. So justification is which one? Anyone remember? No, I mean, is it imparted or is it imputed? It's imputed. So justification is imputed because it's something that you don't have possession over. It's, it was given to you freely. It's not merited. Um, it's, a, it's this free gift that you don't deserve and that you have, no, you have no power over. So God gives this to you, and it just is the way it is. What is sanctification? It's, in, it's imparted. Now, what is imparted me? Given to you. It's, it's yours now. I have possession of it. It's like a robe. If I give you a robe or a, a jacket, let's say, if I give you a jacket, I've imparted it to you. And it's now your jacket. It's no longer my jacket. It's your jacket. And the idea with sanctification is that you have to maintain your, your sanctification. You know, you have, to, you have to maintain that 
that status, I guess, um, and that's your work. But with justification, you have no control over that. So your unalienable rights are similar to justification in that it has nothing to do with you. It's all about God's relationship, or, or not God's relationship, let me say that better. It's all about God's, um, what God has done for you, I guess you could say it that way. Does that make sense? Um, so there's that, that similarity, I guess. So with your unalienable rights, why do you have these rights? Why did God give these rights to you? Well, that is the fact that he's the only one who can give them to you, but why did he give them to you? To make what? To make us equal? Okay. Why do, why do we need to be equal? What? What is the principles of this kingdom? Those rights? Okay, that's true. So what do rights, what? We're children? What's, what does that mean? So what? No, I think you're on the right track. What, what, so what if you're his child? What does that mean? He loves us. You what? You have an inheritance? Okay. So let me give you this. Let me ask you a question. So this is you. You're a human being. And you have a dog. You have a dog. And this is some other person. This person comes over to my dog, kicks my dog. How do you feel about that as, a, as the pet owner? Not happy. You're not so happy about the, the person coming over and, and kicking your dog. Why? Because I'm responsible for that dog? I could, I could still, even if I'm responsible for the dog, I could still be okay with him kicking my dog. I love my dog. So because I love my dog, what do I, what, what, what happens to that dog? Because I love it. I care for it. But what happens to what? What? It's protected by me because I love it. So yes, that's part of it. But so, okay. Yeah, that's part of it. Um, so this dog, Okay, let me, let's do some juxtaposition. Here's you, here's your dog, here's this other person, and here's a squirrel. No, squirrels are too, everyone loves squirrels. They're too squirrely and cute and whatever. We use something else, uh, cat, we got some dog, cat, dog people in there. Um, so we'll say, we'll say a, a rat. You have a rat. This person comes over to this rat and kills the rat. Doesn't just kick it, he kills the rat. How do you feel about that? No, it's just a rat. Good job. You would say, well done. You know, if this was a mouse, a rat or whatever, you would say, oh, got rid of the vermin. Or a snake or, you know, um, for instance, well, we could put squirrel here. If, I, if I'm driving down the road, um, or if someone, not me, you know, but if someone's driving down the road and they hit a squirrel, when you pass that squirrel, do you mourn for the squirrel? Are you like, the squirrel died? Okay, so Sister Lisa does. <laughs> okay, so she's, she's super empathetic. <laughs> so you don't really, it's normal though. You know, you drive down the road and you're like, okay, this squirrel died. You're not going to lose an ounce of sleep. You're going to forget that you even saw that squirrel in five minutes. So there's no... What's the difference between the, the rat or the squirrel and the, my dog? I, my, my relationship with that dog. What else? Okay. I mean, this could, I could love my pet rat. It's what? I view it as a different class. So what is that? What am I giving to that dog? I give him value. I put value into this dog that is not inherently there. You know, 
Now, you have to take the, God has put value in all creatures, but we're looking at this sort of a, in a clinical kind of way. Um, so there's value in this dog that I have placed there. This dog doesn't have value in and of itself because it's a dog. You know, it could be no different than a rat or a squirrel. You know, it could be a wild dog or a feral dog or a, a mangy dog, you know, um, which is all sad, of course. But um, that mangy, feral dog is different. I care, I care about it differently than I care about my dog, correct? My dog, I put value in here. So there's a transfer of value here because of how I view this animal. So I've placed my value into it. Does that animal control its, the value that I place into it? No. no, because at a moment's notice, I could say, I don't value anymore. Now it's probably not gonna happen, it doesn't make sense, but I could do that. I could say, okay, I no longer have value in you and it all falls apart for the dog. He's, no, he's just like a feral dog, you know, at that point. He has, no, he has no value from my perspective. So the reason I care when this person comes over and kicks my dog is because I have value in this dog. I have a relationship with this dog. Um, so let's change, let's change this. This is God. And this is you. God has placed value in you. Instead of a person, we'll call this, it could be a person still, we'll call it the state. Or another person, it could be either one. So God has placed value in me. He values me more than a rat, for instance. I guess it doesn't hold up in this one, this part. But he values me. He's put, in, he's put his value. He sees worth in me that is not intrinsically there. Humanity is not good in and of itself. You know, if, if somehow in some alternate universe you could exist without God, you're not special. You're just the highest thing on the food chain. You know, you're just the, the, the smartest ape. You know, that's Darwinian evolution. It's the, you know, it's the only thing that gives you value is just the fact that you're stronger and more able to survive than someone else or something else. Um, but God has put special value in humanity. And because of that, that value confers um, rights, certain things as protection, as we were saying before. That because he values me so much, I'm entitled to, if we're looking at my dog, if you change this back to the dog, my dog is entitled to eat regularly, to have um, its shots, to um, have easy access to food and water or to a nice bed, you know, whatever, I, whatever right I want to confer to this dog, I will be sure that that dog always has those rights. You know, it always gets the things I want it to have. And that's the same thing that God has done to us. He's given us value. And because of that value, because you're special, you have rights. If you weren't special, you don't have rights. A piece of paper doesn't have rights. It's not special. You know, but even, even an inanimate object, we won't go that far. But anyway, so you have, there's these rights that you have because of the value God has placed in you. Um, and that's only why you have these rights is because of that value. And he wants other people, the state or other people, to respect those rights that he has put in you. So what is the, what, how would we summarize unalienable rights? What did we just say? What, what if we could summarize all of that? Value. Unalienable rights. Unalienable rights are showing you that something is valuable. So I'm going to say that unalienable rights equals value. That there's something special about me. Or, or all humanity, really. So, let's talk about the consent of the governed. Now, this was a really, this is an easy one. So, we tell the government that we consent to be governed by you. And by doing that, let me say, uh, let me say that differently. We form a government and we say, government, we give you the power. We give you the power because it's our power that we're, we're lending to you. As long as you keep my rights protected, that you have the, that you have the right to govern me. And I'm consenting to that government. Are we okay with that? So you have to, what's the difference between the consent of the governed and the papacy? 
does the papacy think you have the right to self or the right of uh, consent? No. They don't care if you consent to be governed or not. Um, it's a they're going to hold you in bondage either way, whether you want to be in bondage or not. It's they're <laughs> going to force you into that bondage. So it's it's a papal idea. It's a it's a idea of a problem. It's a problematic idea. You can say it that way. It's an idea from the time of the problem. So, or the time of Europe, as we had it here before. So I have to consent to be governed. Now, think about God's government. Does God want, so let's think, before, before I say that, um, why didn't God just kill Satan? In the beginning, before he was even Satan. Um, when, the, when the thought of rebellion came into Satan's heart and mind, God knew where this was going. He knew that it was going to eventually get to the point if Satan didn't turn around where um, he would rebel and he'd bring everyone to, you know, bring a third of the angels with him. And so he's at least lost a third of heaven. Um, he also knew that there was the potential for Satan to deceive other worlds and that in doing so, millions and billions of people are, are potentially going to be lost by the actions of Satan if God doesn't stop him. But God didn't stop Satan. He let Satan's rebellion happen. Why did he let it happen? Because he leveraged every single person's life from every angel who, who, went, who went into, um, who followed Satan, from every angel to every human up until the close of probation, Daniel 12, 1, he's, God has taken every single one of those lives and said that whatever reason that he didn't kill Satan that day justified him not, him letting all of those people die. Or allowing that that to happen, for it to to happen. Why, why would he do that? So that's what Sister White says. Is that he wanted love by consent, or he wanted he wanted consent by love, not consent by fear. Um, and he needed the experiment of Satan to play out. Um, because if he had killed him, everyone would have said, whoa, God, why did, Satan was the covering chair. Why did you just kill him like that? You know, he's a great guy. And then God would have said, take my word for it. Um, he was got some problems going on. You know, he, was, he had some rebellion in his heart. And they'd have been like, I don't even know what rebellion is. You know, they, would, they wouldn't understand it. And they would be like, okay, God is indiscriminately killing people at this time. And so it would have been fear. You know, I'm, I'm saying it a little bit funny, silly, but, um, but seriously, Sister White says that there would be a government of fear from that point forward if he had let it happen, or if he had if he killed Satan. So he had to let it play out so that everyone could know the price of sin that was going to take place. He valued your consent and the angel's consent and the fallen world's consent out of love and obedience of love so much that he was willing to sacrifice an infinite amount of things, and even himself, even Christ, um, for the idea of consent. So what I want you to see is that God's government is built on the same two principles that the United States government in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are built on. The idea of value and consent. The idea that as, AT, as the um, Declaration of Independence says, all men are created equal. You're created equal, and that equality you have, that createdness, is, in, is the value he places in you. And are endowed, given, the value is transferred, certain unalienable rights. That was what's given to you. So that's the value. And governments deriving their just power from the consent of the governed. So... God's government is built on these same two principles that the United States government is built on. Do you see that? These are the two principles. So, as we continue our study and thoughts of looking at the United States and specifically the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, we need to keep these two principles in mind, value and consent, and how important they are. Because if I value you, and it's a cause and effect relationship, if I truly value you, 
I want your consent. But if I don't value you, I don't care about your consent. You need both of them and they go hand in hand together. They're in tandem. You can't have one without the other. Um, and it's the foundations of, the gov of this government. And these are the principles that we need to understand. Is that Amen. What is the image of the beast, my sister? Not consent, no value. Amen. The image of the beast is no value in the individual or in, in the person, and there's no consent. That's the image of the beast. The image of God or the government of God is the value in the individual, the value in the person, and the consent of those individuals to be governed. Um, do you see that? You see what you're saying there? The government of God and the government of Satan. And the government of God in heaven is that right? Is the correct way? The government on the, of the United States, it's his proxy was that way, at least in the beginning. And Satan's government, his spiritual government with his angels, is the opposite of this. There's no value, there's no consent. And his earthly kingdom with the papacy, which is the problem, which is his proxy, was exactly the same way as well. There was no value, no consent. So these are the two principles, the two foundations of um, our government. In these two things, if you're willing to see it, they, they're going to we they're going to worm their way into every political problem that we see today, from immigration to abortion to this to that. All of those things, the ideas of value and consent come into them, come into play. Um, how they come into play is another question, but they do come into play in all of these different things. And these are the fundamental principles that are, are weaving themselves through this. And it's the ideas of value and consent that create freedom, true freedom. And does it represent consent? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They wanted to be valued as equal members of society. Remember what the Declaration of Independence says. This we can prove it right now. Um, when, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of Earth the separate and equal station. If I am not equal for, with you, do I have value? I have less value. I don't have equal value. I have less value. What, maybe I have some value, but I have less value. And so the idea that they would break away um, because they felt undervalued is showing you the importance of value, that, they, that their rights were being trampled on and they weren't being respected as individuals. And because of that, because that value was not there from Britain to the United States, Britain didn't care that they didn't have uh, consensual governance, you know? They just said, okay, whatever we say goes, and we don't care what your rights are. And if we look at this, if I erase this, this takes us to our next point. So in our reform line, um, if this was 1989, if you, can, if you can picture this in your mind, if this is 1989, what's this way, Mark? 19 what? 1979. So it would be 1979, uh, and it's 10 years before. So there's something, there, on these lines, there's always something that happens 10 years before. So 10 years before, 1776, is 1766. Do you want to know what happened in that year? An act was passed. Is that the Stamp Act? Nope. It's called the Declaratory Act of 1766. Anyone know what this act says? Probably not. Um, I didn't know about it until I researched it. So let me uh, have a nice little excerpt about it. Give me a moment. Okay. It's from Wikipedia. You can find this. It's also called the American Colonies Act of 1766, but it's uh, commonly known as the Declaratory Act. And it says this. Was an act of Parliament of Great Britain, the declar declaration stated that the Parliament's authority was the same in America as in Britain and asserted Parliament's authority to pass laws that were binding on the colonies doesn't sound too bad, right? All it's saying is that this act 
the Declaratory Act was saying that the, I don't have it drawn here anymore, let me just draw it up again. That the laws, um, and then you're up. The laws that happened here in Europe were binding in the United States or in the colonies because it wasn't the United States yet, in the colonies. So that's not too bad. It's just saying what we do here, we can do here. Um, and it also said, the other thing it said, and it asserted, um, so the authority is the same here and the laws are binding as they are in both places. So that doesn't sound too bad initially, but here's what it actually said. So this is actually a quotation from it um, later down. In this, it's in the same article. And this is a quotation. The Declaratory Act proclaimed that Parliament, quote, had hath, it's written in kind of that English, had hath, and of right ought to have, full power and authority to make laws and statutes of sufficient force and validity to bind the colonies and people of America in all cases whatsoever. And so that was the end quote. The phrasing of the act was intentionally unambiguous. In other words, the Declaratory Act of 1766 asserted that Parliament, oops, of Parliament had the absolute power, absolute power, to make laws and changes to the colonial government in all cases whatsoever, even though the colonists were not represented in Parliament. So that's what it said. So it's doing exactly, it's saying, you have, we're not gonna represent you because you don't have value, but our laws are still binding to you. It's exactly what the papacy would do. Just England is doing it now. So this is a little bit more from that. So this is a quotation from the political theorist, Edward Mims. He describes this, um, this uh, declaratory act in the ramifications. In seven, when in 1766, this modern, modernized British parliament committed by now to the principle of parliamentary sovereignty, unlimited and unlimitable. So they're saying that parliament's power is unlimited and unlimitable. You can't put restraint on it. It's absolute power. Issued a declaration that parliament, parliamentary majority could pass any law it saw fit. It was greeted with an outcry of horror in the colonies. So Americans hear it and they're like, this is crazy. James Otis, Samuel Adams in Massachusetts, Patrick Henry in Virginia, and other colonial leaders along the seaboard screamed treason and Magna Carta. Such a doctrine, they insisted, demolished the existence of all their British ancestors had fought for and took, um, took the very savor out of the fine Anglo-Saxon liberty for which the sages and patriots of England had died. So do you, do you understand what the Declaratory Act did? It basically said you have no rights and you have no consent here. And we're, our sovereignty over you is unlimited and unlimitable. It's absolute. It's papal authority, basically. They have papal authority over the colonies. And the colonies are saying, no way. And that's 10 years before 1776. So you see the thread that weaves its way through. And the, what's interesting about this is I don't know if they didn't make this law, if they didn't pass this act, and if they didn't do some of the other things at the same time, um, that if the United States would ever be the United States, or if we would just be happy British citizens now. You know, they sort of made their bed with this act um, by those kind of things. Um, and there's going to be other stuff like the, uh, the Stamp Act and things like that that you're mentioning um, that are going to add to this. But this one was, was huge for them. Okay. Um, so I'm going to erase this. So what I want, again, I just want to remember this, that as you can see, Britain said that you don't have value and we don't care about your consent. That was the problem. And the United States come up, came and said in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence, actually, God values me. God values me enough that he's given me unalienable rights in those rights that he's conferred to me, one of which um, is that I have sovereignty over you, the state, and you need my consent to govern. So 
you can see the juxtaposition of the ideologies here that with the Declaratory Act and the Declaration of Independence. These two documents, and it's interesting that they're both declarations. This is the Declaratory Act. There's a declaration about that, about what Great Britain thought about the situation, and this is the declaration in response to their what they were saying, and they're exact opposites. They're, you can juxtapose them. Okay. So that is that thought. So I want to talk about the best way to understand. Is that, maybe not the best way. Now let me say this better. One of the ways to understand the true is to look at what? The counterfeit. To look at the opposite. So I want to lay down, I want to look at the opposite of this line. So what would be the opposite of this line? Whose line would it be? It'd be the history of the papacy. Because we're saying that the papacy is the problem and this is the solution. So we should look at the problem and see how it's juxtaposed to this. So, let's put some way marks here. So, um, You take the principle of 1798. Revelation 13:11 is the end of what of what government of what kingdom? Fifth kingdom. It's the end of the fifth, and it's now the rise of the sixth. So if this marks the end, it's the end of the, the previous kingdom, and it's the beginning of the new kingdom. What should this be? It's the same thing. It should be the end of one kingdom and the beginning of another. So. Here, what date would we mark? When would the papacy, if we're going to look at the papacy, when did the papacy, was it established? 538. 538 BC, or uh, AD, sorry. Um, and what, what happens from 538 forward? You have the 1260 years, but the papacy is going to rule supremely now. So you're going to have supreme rule. When does their rule come to an end? 1798, it's the beginning of this one. So this is the history over here. So they're going to rule supremely. Let me erase this. So what is the United States doing here? They're ruling supremely here in 538. What is the United States doing in 1798? Ruling supremely. Supreme rule. Uh, and it's going to end at the Sunday Law, as we said before. Okay, so let's look at the history before this. That's simple. We should all be familiar with this. So, when would we mark? What did we say? So we said this history of time. Here, let me ask this, this, this one. This history of time is what? Here. Agricultural model. The what? The plowing. From here to here is the plowing history. Are we okay with that? I'll put it back up here. Plowing. And then we have our seed right here. So this would be this, the papal seed right there. So if this is the plowing time, and we said the plowing is what? It's the preparation of the soil. So, because it, it has to, the seed has to be received. When was the preparation, his, what was, when did the preparation for the papacy begin? Begin. 508. So from 508, to 538 is the preparation of the soil for the papacy. Now what's really interesting, and I think it's kind of amazing, is we've always understood the history from 508 to 538 was the preparation. We've always called it that even, that this was the preparation and, and now it's established here. But we weren't saying it, we were, we were saying it correct, it was that. But we didn't understand that it was the preparation of the soil that was happening here. Um, that it was really the agricultural model that was being identified. So from 508 to 538, there's a um, preparation that takes place. Now, as we set up here, we have a arrival of a message, and we have an arrival of the message, and then it's gonna be formalized at some point. So, if you give me one moment, um, as part of, 
Okay, let me ask this question. What happens in 508? The daily is the daily's removed. What is the daily? It's paganism. Um, what is it doing to the papacy? It's restraining it. What's another way of saying restraining? It's standing in the way. What is it standing in the way of? What? The growth. It's standing in the way of this process. Who's, 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 who's doing this line? Who's making this line? Who's the master? Who's the, who's the, the, uh, the um, gardener? Who's the gardener here? Satan. Satan. So here, God's the gardener, and here, Satan's the gardener. Or, okay? So Satan's gardening, but something in, so, is in the way. So let's do what we did before. We have a fallow field. What is the fallow field here? Paganism. Paganism is standing in the way of him accomplishing the work of um, doing whatever he needs to do, of making the papacy be what the papacy needs to be. So he has to remove it. And he's going to do that in 508. So something is removed. And we're all familiar with that. So I'm, I'm not going to add anything we don't already understand um, with these histories, with this history. I'm just going to say it in a different way or show you its comparison. So the daily is removed here. It was the, stand, the thing standing in the way, right? All familiar with that. What's removed in 1776? If something's removed here, something's removed here. What's standing in the way of the United States? Great Britain. So Great Britain, in this in instance, is a representation of the daily being removed, but in a good way. So the daily here, the daily, if I can put it that way, here is Great Britain, but the daily here is paganism. And in both instances, they're standing in the way of the accomplishment of this work. They're representing the fallow field. The fallow field here or the daily is um, Great Britain. The fallow field here or the daily is representing uh, paganism. Both of them are standing in the way of the gardener from doing his work with the field. You okay with that? Okay. So the daily is going to remove, be removed here and uh, the papacy is going to begin its preparation. Um, and if we, let's look at the history before that. So we said we have to weave a story. If we're going to weave a story here, we got to weave a story here. We have to be able to see our little anchor points, or, or I mean our little threads. So here, what, what is our theme here? So let me ask this question. What is our theme here? Freedom. What's our theme here? Persecution and captivity. The opposite of freedom. Because they're being juxtaposed. So freedom and captivity are our theme. Do we see, or sorry, do we see captivity in 538? Do we see persecution and captivity here? How do we see persecution and captivity? What begins here? The 1260 years of what? Of persecution of papal supremacy. They're going to persecute from this point forward, from 538 to 1798. So we have persecution and captivity here. How about a 508? What's 508? What happens here? The daily is removed. So that's one thing. But so, okay. So here in 508, there's several many things that happen. But one of the things that happens here is this is when, and I'll read it. This, one, this is from Daniel and Revelation, D-A-R 257, paragraph 2. Let it be marked that in this year, 508, paganism had so far declined and Catholicism has so far relatively increased in strength that the Catholic Church, for the first time, waged a successful war against both the civil authority of the empire and the Church of the East, which had for the most part embraced the monotheistic, mono, monophyte, mono, mono, I don't know how to pronounce that, monophysite, yeah, doctrine, and the extermination of 65,000 heretics uh, was the result. So here they begin a war that's going to end in the, the death of 65,000 people. Is that persecution and captivity? Amen. It's persecution and captivity. They're going to persecute this, these uh, people. Yep. Yeah, D-A-R 257.2. Okay. Okay. Um,
And so there's a there's persecution and captivity here, and there's persecution and captivity here. So what is this event in 1766? What is it? What is the relationship of this event to this event? Say that again. Sorry, sorry, one sorry, sorry, years again. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, they're juxtaposed. What else? I mean, freedom is here and freedom is here. There's freedom at both points. But the question is, this event here in 1766, let me ask this question. If I made this, if I, if I uh, here, I'll put it over here. If I made this uh, 1979 and 1989, What's the relationship between these two events? What? War. War, okay. Proxy war, but what is the... What? Okay, um, bad question. I'm asking a bad question then. Um, who needed to see this? Adventism. Everyone needed to see this event. Why? What would they have known if they had seen 1979? They would have known 1989 was coming. They would have seen that there's a relationship between the two of them, and this one is pointing you to this one. You see that? It was a harbinger to some degree. So that's the same thing here. If Great Britain should have known that if you do something like this, this is going to be the result. So what happens here? What is, what is this event? Maybe we're not familiar with this. So what, when is 10 years before? Four, four ninety one. Four ninety eight. Four ninety eight. something is gonna happen. So we'll read about that. It's going to be a harbinger for this event. So let's read about 498. This is Daniel and Revelation, D-A-R, 256 paragraph three. D-A-R 256 paragraph three. The condition of the Sea of Rome was also peculiar at this time. In 498, Symmachus ascended to the pontifical throne as the recent convert from paganism. He reigned to, to AD 514. He found his way to the papal chair, says Hu Pin, by striving with his competitor even to blood. So he killed his competitor. To get the, to be the papal uh, the papist, uh, to be the pope, he received adulation as the successor of Saint Peter and struck the keynote of papal assumption by presuming to excommunicate the emperor Anastasius. So the pope, from my understanding, for the first time is going to excommunicate uh, an emperor. Here in 490, or um, he's going to do this, Pope Symmachus. Um, continuing on, the most servile flatterers of the Pope now began to maintain that he was constituted judge in the place of God and that he was the vicegerent of the Most High. When we think about the vicegerent of the Most High and the, the position of the Pope being the judge for God, you know, taking the place of God, it all comes back to Pope Symmachus in 498. He's the first Pope that they start saying this for. They're the first one they start mentioning all these kind of things where that he's the vice general of God and that he's the Pope, um, the judge of judge for God. And he's also, um, he also assumes papal uh, supremacy over the state by excommunicating the, the emperor. So he's going to be the first one to do all of these things in the right around in 498. Some of these things take place. I'm not sure if they all do, but he's mentioning it here. And and this was this should have been a harbinger for for the um, for the world to know that if this is happening with Pope Symmachus in this year, that in ten years this is going to happen in five hundred eight. The, the paganism will be removed, and now the papacy will begin its ascension. Do we see that? So it's the same dynamics here and here and here as well. They're harbingers, and they're pointing to the if you see this event, you should see this event, or you should see that it's coming. Um, and so that's really interesting that, all, that you have this 10 for all these histories. And so what message arrives here? What message? What? 
groups. Okay, the first, thank you. <laughs> what message arrives in 508? What's our, what, what theme arrives here? Captivity and persecution. That's our theme. The message, just like the message of freedom arrived in 1776, the execution of persecution and captivity arrives here. Now, what's the problem in 508? The problem, what's the problem in 1776? What's the problem in 1989? That message isn't formalized yet. It has to be formalized into something else. When is the message of the papacy, the message of persecution and captivity formalized? Anyone know? What? 533. What happened in 533, my brother? Justinian's decree. Justinian's decree. In 533. So let's read something from... So remember, this should formalize the idea of persecution and captivity. But if you want to say it another way, the supremacy of the papacy over the earthly powers. So this is Daniel Revelation, to page 260. I'll read just a couple excerpts from that page. So this is a quote from Justinian's decree. Therefore, we have made... So this is Justinian to the Pope. Therefore, we have made no delay in subjugating and uniting to your holiness all the priests of the whole East. So he's, he's giving them all the priests. He's subjugated them to the, to the, uh, to the papacy. Justinian did. Reading on. Um, uh, and repeated his decision that all, all affairs touching the church shall be referred to the Pope, head of all bishops, and true and effective corrector of heretics. So now they're going to be made the corrector of heretics. And um, I missed something. Where is it? Um, Okay, no mind. Um, continuing on, um, just one last part. It, it, the Justinian's decree also says this: it, it uh, confers the title to the Pope as Elder, as the Elder Rome, as the Elder Rome was founder of the laws. Sorry, the preamble of the Ninth State states that as the Elder Rome was the founder of the laws, so was was it not to be questioned that in her was the supremacy of the pontificate. It's sort of weird at work, but it's saying that the Pope is superior, um, that Rome is superior. Uh, that, uh, it also says this, we therefore decree that, that the most holy Pope of the, of the elder Rome is the first of all the priesthood. So, um, and that most blessed Archbishop of Constantinople, the new Rome, shall, be, shall hold the second rank after the Pope. So anyway, what Justinian's decree is going to do, and you can see in some of those things, I didn't, can't read the whole thing for time. Um, it would have been better, though. Um, is it sets up that the Pope is the head of the church. It's, it, it, it sets forward also the premise that the Pope is the corrector of heretics, so it's getting its persecution. But it also sets forth the idea that Justinian is subordinate to the Pope because he's going to do his bidding for him. Um, so it lays down all these principles, which are exactly what Satan wants to be established here. You know, he wants, those are his principles. Those are the foundations of his government um, to set the papacy up. So the, the message is formalized in 533, and then the Pope is established in 538, and he's going to take his throne, and he's going to rule supremely at this point. Um, so do you see the similarities in both of these lines? They're, almost, they're identical. They're just opposites. Uh, which is amazing. Um, they even are connected by date, the date, uh, 1798, where one ends, the other begins. And um, one last, uh, something else. I'm missing something. I just had it a second ago. Give me one second. Maybe I can refresh my memory. Oh, that's where I wanted to go. So, how would you classify Satan's work here? So, I need you to take this, sounds bad, but take a satanic perspective. He's copying God. He's copying God, okay. But from Satan's perspective, was this a successful work that he did? Did he get, did he, 
accomplish the work of preparing the soil and then planting a seed. Yes, it was a perfect work. He didn't say, I, you know, it, it could have been better. You know, maybe I could have, I could have had a better, a better version of the Pope or something. You know, that it, was, it was good enough. It was exactly what he wanted it to be. He, it was his, what does Sister White call? What? His crowning act is the papacy. It's his, um, his masterpiece, his satanic masterpiece is what the papacy is. It's his perfect tool. Um, so if it's his masterpiece, and we're saying this was a perfect work that Satan did, right? He perfectly did everything. He plowed the soil. He planted the seed. And it did its whole work for its t the time that it was allotted until its end. Um, it was all a perfect work, all right up until the end where they apostatized. Um, what must that mean here for the United States? It was a perfect work that was done. So the work that God was trying to accomplish of solving the problem of, of persecution and captivity um, by introducing ideas of freedom through the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, it means that those principles and those documents are perfect. That this was a perfect work that God did going through this history until it comes to its end to where it's, you know, it, it, it just ends. Um, so what I want us to see is that this is perfect, this is perfect, and if we drew our line underneath it with the same way marks, our line is perfect. It's God again, God being the master planter there as well. So all of these are perfect, and that means, as I just already said, that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, the principles in there, in those documents, are perfect by that standard. So the reason I say this is because we have a line, we have a line of thought um, that shows the downfall of the United States. It shows you the dirty, despicable history of the United States from its beginning to its end. You know, I can show you, we can all sit here and list from, from 1798 to the Sunday Law, all the error in the United States, from slavery to women, prop, to the uh, problem with women, to the problem with um, the Civil Rights Act, to the problem of um, homosexuality, to all these different things. You can show just the dirty history of the United States that it has, in, in some ways, had failed to live up to those premises, uh, to, the, to these things. But what I would suggest is that each one of those histories was a success. So take slavery. We have slavery in the United States today. By slavery, let me qualify, by slavery, do we have African Americans subjugated to um, the United States? That, that uh, um, how do they call it? Uh, Chattel, chattel slavery, is that how you're saying? Um, do we have that today? No, we, we got rid of that. Um, there was a controversy and the principles prevailed. The principles of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution prevailed. Um, and I wish we could get into that. It's such a fantastic history. Um, it's, a, it's a grim history, but it's a fantastic history because if you look at the people who were standing in the United States fighting slavery, they used the Constitution to do it. And what's interesting is they use the Constitution to say that slavery was wrong and the Declaration of Independence, but the slave owners used the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence to justify their position. So as our, I think our brother was saying before, um, there's the, 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 the problem of how you read is directly related to the slavery issue. Same thing for the women problem. Should women vote? Are women equal in society? The Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, if you read them correctly, have a very explicit opinion on them. And it says they are equal. When you come to um, civil rights movement, again, there's a battle over how we're going to read it. You know, some, we don't have slavery anymore, but we, now we have segregation. And we have all the different things that come with segregation, all the racism. And what happens? Constitution says that's wrong. And what happens? You have all the laws, you have the Supreme Court acts that justify that position. So in all of these instances, homosexuality, um, 2015, it's, it's the Supreme Court comes and says it's wrong based upon the Constitution, their reading of the Constitution. So in every single one of these crises, the Constitution has always been correct. And if, if I would say, 
because the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence are the principles, they represent the principles, they're never going to be wrong. There's never, even at the Sunday Law, it's not that they're wrong. What does Sister White say about the Sunday Law? What it happens to the Constitution at the Sunday Law? She, there's a word she uses in the Great Controversies. No, not abrogated. What? Repudiated. What does the word repudiate mean? To disregard something. It's not that the Constitution is going to say that it's right to have church and state. It's that if the Constitution is the charts over here, and we're supposed to be looking at the charts to get our information, we go like this. You know, it doesn't matter what the charts say. We're going to do it this way. The, const the, the charts were always correct. It always said, don't do that. We just said, we don't really care what it says. So that's what's going to happen at the Sunday Law. The Constitution has always been correct, and it will always be correct. Now, there's a question, and I saw this question raised in the uh, chats. So I am reading your chats, guys, <laughs> guys um, during some of the breaks. Um, the question was, is the Declaration, or is the Constitution a living document or a static document? And that's something we battle with today. That's something that Supreme Court justices battle with, how to view the Declaration, or the Constitution. So let me bring in this aspect with our remaining minutes. How long do I have? Seconds. What? I, okay, I have 10 minutes. Okay. So I'll try to make it five. So the, if we make this line here, this top line, um, let me do it this way. So uh, let me just make a quick new line. You have 1798, and we're gonna take this from the Millerite perspective. What arrives in 1798? First angel's message. Is the first angel's message complete? What does it need? The second and the third. It needs help. It needs added information from the second and third angel's message um, because it wasn't complete in and of itself. There was progress that was made. There was upward progress from the first to the second to the third. Um, an increase of knowledge all the way through. So if we take this and we bring this up to here, and this is the agricultural model, but with the mess angels, three angels' messages, then we should see the same progress here. And you do see it. Because here, what do you have? What's this? A seed. What is this over here? We had it before. A tree. What's the difference between a tree and a seed? A lot. There's a, it's the same DNA, but it's grew into what, the full stature of whatever it was supposed to be. What? It's matured. It's matured. So how, does the, how would we see maturation with the Constitution? The amendment system. The amendment system is what allows the Constitution to grow to meet the ever-changing needs of the present moment. But what's the the amendment system? While it's going to, you know, while they were smart enough to realize that things would have to change, um, what remains the same? The principles. What remains the same in the seed and in the tree? The DNA. The principles remain the same from beginning to end. The only thing is, is that there's progress, there's growth. So to answer the question, I do believe it's a progress, it's a living document, but it's only living in the sense that we can take the principles that are found in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and apply them to the changing needs of society, whatever that may be. And it should always give us the right answer for whatever that, that situation is, whether it's prohibition, you know, whether you're looking at alcohol, whether you're looking at abortion, whether you're looking at um, gun rights or, you know, whatever the thing may be. You know, there's things today that they didn't have back then that we have to take into account. Um, and the Constitution allows for that growth and it, and it will always, if you read it correctly, it will always come out on the right side of every issue because those principles of value and consent and the values of freedom are the values that God has. That's his government of freedom, value, and consent. And if all those remain the same and you allow them to have the proper place, it's always going to give you the right output. You're, if you input freedom, value, and consent, your output is always correct. And that's the same thing for the Constitution. If you input those principles, you get the right answer to your question on the output. Amen? Okay. So we have to close here. Um, sorry we didn't get further, but it's at least a good taste. Um, if you want more on this, I did, I did similar things um, at, in, uh, in Lambert. I did in Canada. 
um, but also at uh, in Lambert back in Arkansas. Um, if you go to Lambert Fellowship, I did a couple presentations covering similar things, but a lot of things we didn't cover here. A ton of things we didn't cover here. But we we'll also did a class this last week, and we will continue to do next week, not this coming week, but the following week, um, back in Arkansas at School of the Prophets. Um, continuing this thought, so it's not, I'm not leaving it right here. Um, just can't finish it today. Um, so what I want us to take, the, there's two main things I want us to take uh, right now on these. One of them is the idea of the perfection of this line, the, that, that God did the right thing and that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are, are good documents. Um, and they have their place at certain times. They have their, the Declaration of Independence speaks to one thing, as we said before on the hierarchy, and the Constitution speaks to the other. And you need both of them to hammer out the relationship of all three parts of the hierarchy of God, people, and the state. Um, so that was the one thing, and I want to just say that those these things are perfect. Um, and also, I want us to identify the ideas of value and consent, and that it's not so simple as just to say value or just to say consent. There are deeper principles within that that you can see woven into the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and those are the same principles that which um, that God's government is built on, and. We, should, we need to understand that if we're going to understand the history we're in presently and the answer to the problem of whatever this event may be, however it shakes out, whatever the Sunday law looks like, you need to understand these principles to be able to give the right answer to the question, as we said before. You input value, consent, and freedom into the Constitution, and it will give you the answer, and into prophecy, really, and it will give you the answer to whatever the conundrum is here, um, and presently, whatever it is even presently. Um, so I hope this was a blessing, and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the parables that you set before us. We thank you that you've shown us that the United States is actually a parable for your government. And we pray that you would help us to understand that parable of the United States, that we can understand your government and your characteristics, Lord, in your, your character more clearly, in your love for us and the value that you want for us. And the, uh, you value us so much, Lord, that you would sacrifice everything that we could give you proper consent if we would so choose. We pray that you help us to take these principles and apply them into our lives, to apply them into our, our interpersonal communications and our feelings with each other. We pray that you would guide us to value each other and value each other's consent and we ask that you would just guide us and protect us more. We just pray that you would bless the remainder of our Sabbath and time together. And if anyone's leaving on, we pray that you give them family blessings. We just thank you for all the participation. Amen.